Hello comrades, it seems that the uh, red and black revolutionary has responded to my video called my thoughts on anarchism. I'm actually surprised that he didn't uh, respond to this earlier. I remember a lot of people being pretty pissed about the video at the time. Um, but anyway, so let's let's just take a look. Hello. Um, so I'm going to be doing a video response to a video by the Finnish Bolshevik. And I also want to kind of critique the whole video. Um, because as is the theme with, with the Finnish Bolshevik, it seems, is that the video is rather shit. Uh, completely... Like, like poorly researched to the point where I don't think he's read any any anything on anarchism besides me okay that's your opinion it's kind of weird I mean the red and black revolutionary is kind of a contradictory individual in some sense because I've just gotten the impression that in some topics he knows what he's talking about but on some topics he has no fucking idea so I don't know. Maybe he's going to point out, I mean, I assume he's going to point out where I was wrong. But he's actually incorrect, although, of course, he has no way of knowing if I've what I've read, but... I've read The God and the State by Bakunin. I read on... I read Mutual Aid. I read Conquest of Bread by Kropotkin, and, uh... From Proudhon, I read Property is Theft, and then, uh... The... I didn't read the other books from Proudhon um, in, in their entirety, but I, I went to an anarchist website which explained Proudhon's views on certain things. For example, when I said that Proudhon, I think I said in that video that Proudhon supported uh, like, kind of like reformism and pacifism, that is actually, I got that information from an anarchist website but I did not read the book where he says that in its entirety, but I have read, you know, those other books. Pretty uneducated. Um, it relies mostly on really, really broad generalizations. Yeah, I will give you that. I do generalize a lot, but I expect that people will understand that I'm generalizing. Throwing terms around, which I don't think he knows the full meaning of. Again, this is something that... When I say that uh, I don't consider anarchism to be real socialism for this reason or that reason, you know, we can debate endlessly about these definitions. Or when I say that anarchists are utopian or idealist or metaphysical, like, you know, we can endlessly, de we can endlessly debate these terms, but I'm pretty sure that people understand what I'm trying to say when I'm using those terms. He starts out by saying that anarchism is petty bourgeois adventurism with no success. Uh, or at least with no significant uh, success. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's a bit provocative, I, I admit. Kind of a... Yeah, but I, I stand by my words. I, I, I do agree with that statement. First of all, the, the first thing I want to address is the fact that a lot of these generalizations that he makes um, can, are, you know, the same type of generalizations are used to dismiss Marxism. I don't see how that's a generalization, though, because I think that everyone recognizes that these anarchist revolutions were fairly local and uh, short-lived, while the while Marxism and Marxist-Leninist revolutions spread to you know half the globe, and the Soviet Union was the second biggest economic and military power in the world, so. That's that's the kind of success that I'm talking about. Anarchism wasn't successful compared to that, you know, in that sense. Um, so let's break down the specific claim that he makes. Uh, the first adjective he uses is to describe anarchists, which he never really explains why he uses this adjective. Um, he never defines this adjective. He, he just he just uses the adjective uh, as a, a, a I, I guess sort of a uh, gotcha term. Oh, I can call the anarchists petite bourgeois. Uh, ho ho. Look at how smart I am, or something. It's not really, haha, look how smart I am. In a way, it's a bit of an insult, 
but it but uh, then again it's not an insult it's kind of like when people call each other revisionists it's it's kind of kind of insulting to be called a revisionist but then again some people are actually revisionists so in the same way i can understand why nobody wants to be called petty bourgeois but anarchism is still a petty bourgeois ideology now you say that i don't define the term okay let me try to explain it to you anarchism is based on principles of freedom and individual rights and liberties um, Marxism on the other hand and Mar you know this is in, in the context of Marxism so Marxism says that it's proletarian socialism proletarian scientific materialist socialism um, as opposed to petty bourgeois utopian idealist socialism which existed before you know the French utopian socialists and British utopian socialists etc etc Marxism is based on concrete material reality it's not based on these noble you know high minded principles like the utopian socialism is and the way anarchism is now you might disagree you might say that anarchism is not based on any great principles that instead it's based on like raw scientific fact or something but i disagree with that but that's a totally different topic again so anarchism is based on these va rather vague principles especially when we look at the you know old school anarchist Proudhon Proudhon is particularly bad in this regard I'm not saying that every anarchist agrees with everything that Proudhon has said petty bourgeois ideologies like utopian socialism um, of the French variety or the Narodniks in Russia or whatever it's always characterized by these vague principles sometimes it's not materialist at all like it's it's idealist the way um, Proudhon was or it might claim to be materialist but it's not just it's just really bad materialism it's focused on the individual and individual rights and liberties rather than strict um, organization organizational unity organizational discipline when anarchists hear the word discipline I think that immediately you know creates negative connotations in their minds that is a very petty bourgeois notion that there's many reasons why anarchism is petty bourgeois in my opinion the other thing is this this idea of these this local democracy local autonomous communities which don't function in accordance with any kind of strict centralized plan un united plan this kind of decentralism is exactly what Proudhon was arguing for I mean Proudhon was way more extreme in that regard than most anarchists these days but anyway and that is a that is petty bourgeois also like the idea that um, a person needs to get the full full value of their labor that is a petty bourgeois notion because it's based on this petty bourgeois idea of justice more than anything um, you know not only that but it's also impossible for a person to get the full value of, of his labor unless he is literally a petty bourgeois who just like a peasant who works his own land that's the only way a person can get the full value of their labor because um, even in, in socialism part of that value is used to um, sustain the state and even in full stateless communism that value is used for other things than uh, just the person himself getting uh, getting wages people don't even get wages uh, in in moneyless communism so it's literally not possible for a person to receive the full value of their labor even if we're not in capitalism where there's exploitation um, if you are if it's unclear to you why anarchism is called petty bourgeois you know read Proudhon and you will see like Proudhon is a much more extreme example of this most like modern anarchists are not as extreme in in their petty bourgeoisness if that's a wor word I said that anarchism is based on vague principles of freedom rather than anything else well Proudhon takes this to a an incredible extreme like he talks about eternal justice is what he calls it he thinks that he says that things have to be done in accordance with eternal justice he says that it's unfair that somebody doesn't get the full value of their labor it's exploitation is bad because it's not in accordance with eternal justice which is you know 
that's the most, most out of touch, like petty bourgeois notion ever. Exploitation is bad because people are literally starving while there's rich people who, who live in luxury. It do doesn't have anything to do with justice. In the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels define the term petty bourgeois or petite bourgeois um, to mean either the middle classes of society or small time capitalist industries. I know. It's petty bourgeois based ideology. You say that Marx defines this term to mean this. Well, I mean, Marx said that these people were petty bourgeois Philistines. Um, so if, if Marx's word is all, all that's necessary, then, you know, that's what Marx said. Oh, the mom and pop shop, things like that. Um, so the reason anarchists are not petty bourgeois is because anarchists do not have a history of supporting either the middle classes of society. Um, well, I mean, anarchists, like, most anarchists are not literally petty bourgeois. Their ideology is, is just the ideology of petty bourgeois. Um, and besides, you say that anarchists don't have like a history of supporting the petty bourgeois, like the middle class. If you read like um, the housing question by Engels, it's arguing against a Proudhon supporter who is an you know an anarchist who is, you know, as petty bourgeois and as pro-middle class as you could possibly get, so anarchists do have a history of doing this. Now, I definitely think there are examples of anarchists doing this. Um, you know, this is probably a point... I mean, this is some... Okay, okay, fair enough. So you're just saying that I'm generalizing too much. Well, you know, fine, whatever. Okay, I can accept that, maybe. I think that I criticize mutualists for a lot. Um, I definitely think mutualism is somewhat petite bourgeois. Okay, then I think we are in some level of agreement here. Um, but I don't think that you can call anarchism as a whole petite bourgeois. Okay, I see what you mean, but... Yeah, okay, like Kropotkin is not nearly as petty bourgeois as Proudhon, but in my view he is still a bit petty bourgeois. Just not nearly as much. Because anarchism as a whole, um, as a tendency, strives to create a, so a society struggled for by the working class, um, where the means of production are owned in common, and things are administered by a social plan. Mm, well, okay, now we're getting to the nitty-gritty of this subject. Like, okay, how do you define a common plan? How is this plan created? Because what I've noticed is that a lot of anarchists will argue in favor of this full local control and this kind of decentralization, which runs counter to any kind of national plan or any kind of a common plan. And also this idea of trading between the communities sounds a bit sketchy. Something also that contradicts this notion that um, anarchists are petite, petite bourgeois is anarcho-communists have a history of criticizing markets. I mean, by that, if you're just saying that because anarchists want a society that's run by the workers, then by that definition, no, nobody is petit bourgeois who just wants socialism. I never said that all anarchists support markets, and I don't think you're saying that I did, but you know, what does it matter? Like, I don't, I'm not saying that all anarchists support markets, I'm saying that some of them do. Proudhon did, Bakunin did, okay, Kropotkin didn't, he was very against, very much against those. Um, but that's not really my basis for saying that anarchism is petty bourgeois. So it's kind of beside the point. Anarchists are not petite bourgeois, that's wrong. Um, he also says that anarchists... I think this is more about you misunderstanding me than me misunderstanding the term petty bourgeois. You just don't know what I mean by the term. Um, I'm not misusing the term, you just don't know what it means. Um, but, oh well. It's our adventurist. Um, he never defines this term either. Okay. Um, well, I mean, 
I didn't define every term that I used because I, th I know that these terms have a definition. I expected people to know what the definition is. Like, that's kind of how language works. Like, do I need to define every word I use every time I use it? Like, I know what the Marxist definition of, or what, what context is usually taken, but seems that the dictionary definition from, of adventurism is the willingness to take risks in business or politics, actions or attitudes regarded as reckless or potentially hazardous. So I suppose that's pretty much correct. It's the same way it's used in Marxism. Anarchists tend to be rather extreme, rather ultra-left, um, and, you know, adventurists in their tactics. They want to overthrow the state and just abolish it. Like the Finnish anarchists, for example, I would call them people who just want to get into fights with the cops and just want to get in trouble with the police for, you know, even if it doesn't achieve anything. They don't, they're not really serious. They're playing at revolution, is how Lenin would say it. It was last May Day. There's a big demonstration of people, totally peaceful, but the anarchists had made plans that they will cause some, like, huge fight there. So, and they, they had been stupid enough. I don't know if it was deliberate. It, it, it was so bad that it was almost like a deliberate act of sabotage, but, like, they, they had made plans to have this big, to cause this big fight in that peaceful demonstration, then they had leaked those plans so that the cops had learned of it in advance. So there were, like, cops from every major city in Finland. I mean, there aren't that many, but basically there were, like, cops from all over the place. There were more cops than there were demonstrators. <laughs> there was, there were so many cops. And then... The, the the demonstration is totally peaceful, everything's going just fine, until, like, one of the anarchists hits a cop in the face, which I have, you know, in principle, I don't have anything against that. But you know what happens? The cops, you know, take all the anarchists, and they shut the whole demonstration down. They even took, like, all the flags and everything from everybody else, not just the anarchists, and, like... The Finnish Communist Party was there, and I'm, I don't agree with them, but... Um, they had some flags. The cops took their flags and fucking broke them. <laughs> and Because they were supposedly weapons. Like, they were using them to hit people or something, even though the anarchists were the only one doing that. That's adventurism. Like, there's a time for violence, but that wasn't the time for violence. That's literally what adventurism means. Now, you're gonna tell me that I'm generalizing, but I don't think this is the only instance when anarchists have been doing this. They've been doing this always. There's a culture of adventurism within anarchism. There's a culture of this mindless extremism in anarchism. Just re revolt. Mindless revolt for revolt's sake. I don't know where its origins are. Like, I don't know where it originated from. I mean, I would guess probably Bakunin. Because, I mean, Proudhon was a pacifist and reformist. But Bakunin said that people should just, like, commit revolutionary acts of terrorism to inspire people, and that they should kill rich people as purely as vengeance, which is totally just pointless. Um, and just, um, like, literally, he said that they should, like, burn everything down so that it would, so that they could start totally from scratch, like, destroy everything so that they could just start from scratch. Um, so that, that sounds, pretty much like the stereotypical view of anarchism, that they just want to break shit up for no uh, good reason, even if it doesn't achieve anything. That's what adventurism means. Though he uses it quite a bit, um, he never says why anarchists are adventurists, but anarchism, anarchists are not adventurists. Adventurism essentially means um, recklessly wanting to um, go forth into the future. Well, I think I've pretty much demonstrated how they are pretty re reckless. I mean... It's, they have a culture of recklessness, but they also have it in their ideology because they're opposed to strict organization and strict unity and leadership, which inevitably leads to recklessness. Anarchists do not recklessly want to go forth in the future. Anarchists want a social revolution that is, pro that is the product of... Uh, that, it, that is the product of a process of 
working class and oppressed people taking power and abolishing specific institutions that anarchists feel are on principle oppressive. Well, yeah, whatever. I don't really care much for those principles. Billions of poor people, there's millions of people starving, there's millions of homeless. Like, these high-minded notions are not my priority. So it's not a reckless kind of let's just progress at, at, at um, any rate possible. It's uh, a principled, uh, progressive um, idea for how a future society can exist and can be maintained. He also says that anarchism has had no success, and later in the video he justifies this assertion by saying that, okay, maybe anarchists have only taken power for a short time, but it's never been a lasting uh, thing. Um, I'm not sure what exactly he means by that. Uh, anarchists have always been part of the labor of the um, of the labor movement of the socialist movement. Um, you know. Uh, well, I mean, I said that the anarchist revolutions have always been relatively, relatively local, and they haven't ever really lasted. The point of that was that they were not able to militarily defend themselves. Um, because of anarchist tactics, anarchist ideology, you might argue that, okay, they never had a chance no matter what the ideology. Like, okay, maybe, but I don't really necessarily buy that. And even if that was the case, they still would have been better off using other kinds of methods and other kinds of ideology. And again, to return to the petty bourgeois point, anarchism just like Trotskyism, has never really been that successful or, or that popular in third world countries among actual proletarians. It appeals to petty bourgeois type of people. It appeals, appeals to people who have petty bourgeois consciousness. People who are all about, you know, this individual liberty, these, uh, these kinds of individualism, these kinds of principles instead of people who are actually like suffering horrible exploitation who don't really don't really care about any of these principles they just care about actual material conditions you know that's why maoism is so big in for example india and the philippines and like all these asian countries like nepal in africa like anarchism hasn't really ever been very successful in these countries and I would argue, like, Trotskyism is another good example. Like, look at Trotskyism. It's, it's pretty much just popular in Great Britain. And uh, quite a big part of it. Um... Well, I mean, I was trying to find information about anarchists, anarchist, like, ongoing anarchist guerrilla movements or anarchist revolution, uh, revolutionary movements, but I couldn't really find any on, online. There's countless communist ones couldn't find any anarchist ones, um, so maybe you know some that I don't, but I couldn't really find any. You know, there's just a bunch of white people in, in Western countries smashing windows, pretty much. They're not real, they're not doing the same kind of revolution that the Maoists in India, for example, are doing, or, you know, FARC in Colombia, or any, like, the closest thing to actual, like, anarchists who are doing, actually doing shit are the uh, Zapatistas, but even they aren't anarchists, they're libertarian Marxists, so um, even though some anarchists try to take credit for that, but they're, you know, they're libertarian Marxists who support Che Guevara and all that, so... Very easily um, point out the fact that um, the quote-unquote socialist states um, pretty much <coughs> all collapsed. Uh... Um, <coughs> yeah, whatever. Um, <coughs> And I'm somebody. Somebody in the comments, I'm sure, is going to say that I'm smoking weed, but <clears throat> no, it's it's actually coffee. <clears throat> I'm like drowning in coffee right now. <clears throat> so anyway, um, what did you say? Like the socialist states collapsed. Yes, you know the same way that. I mean, is this supposed to be a counter argument? Like, yeah, they did, but it. It's not like I find it hard to believe that it's systemic to Marxism that it doesn't that, that Marxism just doesn't work that that's why they collapsed 
Because if that would have been the case, then they wouldn't have lasted so long. I mean, yes, they were defeated by capitalism, but I think it was still pretty damn successful, even though in the end it was defeated. It, you know, might have, might just as well have been the other way around, that capitalism was defeated. But in the case of anarchism, I think anarchism hasn't really ever been so successful that it would be taken, that it should be taken so seriously. Like, if they have some revolution which survives for three years, you know, mind you, with like huge Soviet backing and all that, then, you know, okay, I don't, I don't see how that's so great. Because it's not like anarchism spread to like half of the planet or something like communism did. And, you know, okay, there's the, there was the Ukrainian thing, which most anarchists probably will denounce Magno, or at least they should. Um, and again, the only reason that Magno was able to do his thing was because of the Bolsheviks, because the Bolsheviks caused the entire thing to start the entire um, destabilization of the uh, regime, the Russian Empire. And um, the Bolshevik Red Army was taking the brunt of the white white uh, army's atta attacks while Magno was just terrorizing the rear which sounds pretty dirty so anyway so Magno was terrorizing the rear of the white armies which would have been impossible if the Bolshevik army hadn't been at the front uh, collapsed specifically back into capitalism which is funny because he, he, he... as did you know anarchism but I already argued my point. I think you know what I, I'm trying to say. He insists that anarchism will lead to restoration of capitalism. It did. Um, like, anarchism, in a way, anarchism is such a failure that it's harder to see how, just how bad it is. Like, the Catalonian economy was a disaster. The Catalonian military was a disaster. Like, the anarchist um, militia was a disaster. And the ideology was a disaster. But they were just so quickly defeated militarily that it didn't even last long enough for the economic collapse to take place and then the ideological collapse to take place. The Soviet military was so strong that they survived militarily. Their economy was so strong that they survived economically. So um, that's why during the course of 70 years there was time for ideological revisionism to happen. If it had failed as quickly as anarchism did, then we could just blame it on Hitler or something, say that, oh, socialism would have been perfect if Hitler just hadn't destroyed it. Um, the way anarchists are saying that, oh, anarchism would have just worked wonderfully if the fascists hadn't destroyed it. No, it would have collapsed on its own, even without Franco. Um, that is my firm belief based on evidence. Like, look at the stats for... Uh, the I've seen statistics on the Catalonian economy that show that it's steady, steadily declining. Um, haven't seen any statistics to the contrary. Although if you do have some, then I would be interested to see those. Um, and it's also an established fact that the uh, finance minister of the anarchists begged the Spanish state to give them more money, which would certainly certainly sounds like they were in some financial difficulty, that the anarchist economy wasn't exactly doing great. Um, when historically all of his, you know, beautiful, flawless Leninist uh, states have reverted to capitalism. Uh, come on, you can't say that I'm making a straw man argument when, when you say shit like that. I, I've never said that they were flawless, quite the, quite the opposite. Um, I've always said that the problem with anarchists is that every time something isn't flawless, they just totally reject it. In my opinion, it's precisely the opposite. Like, it's always been the problem that anarchists don't, are not willing to accept imperfection in, um, really existing socialism, which is why they always reject it. It's the same problem with Trotskyists and left communists, too. But I can give you my own criticism of the Soviet Union of the, not, not just the revisionist Soviet Union, but the Stalin-era Soviet Union and Lenin-era Soviet Union, if you want, but that's another topic for another time. Actually, their purpose was uh, oftentimes to develop capitalism in these regions. Uh, for example, uh, Russia and China. Um, the Russian and Chinese 
quote-unquote socialist states were part of a long process of the development of capitalism in both Russia and China. Essentially, you're saying that because they wanted to develop the economy and develop industry, they were somehow supporting capitalism, which is not the case. I mean, they didn't support capitalism, they just allowed it to happen. I mean, because capitalism is progressive compared to feudalism, and it's also good because it, you know, builds up the economy. But the only reason that they allowed capitalism for a, for a period of time to exist is because it's, it's pretty hard to get rid of it, you know? You can't, you can't just get rid of it just like that. Collectivization of agriculture took 10 years. It's pretty tough to do. Unless you just go around pointing guns at people's heads, telling them that, okay, now this is a com commune which is what the anarchists did in Catalonia, but I don't think that's a lasting solution. And besides, why are you blaming these, the socialists for allowing private property to exist for a while when Mac noted the exact same, exact same thing? He didn't fucking collectivize anything. He had a couple of small communes and that was it. So his next point is that anarchists are right-wing, um, and he justifies this. Um, by pointing out that anarchists um, buy into bourgeois lies, quote unquote, about uh, quote unquote socialist states. Uh, did I really say right wing? I mean, maybe you're misunderstanding what I said. Uh, these ideologies, which are typically called ultra left or left communist or whatever, seen as more left than Leninism. In the Leninist view, they're not more left, they're just um, right-wing ideology masquerading as left ideology. You know, because petty bourgeois ideology and individualist ideology is right-wing. Anarchism is individualistic and petty bourgeois. It's just, it just uses left-sounding um, left rhetoric. So Lenin called it inside-out or upside-down right-wing ideology. That's why usually when people say ultra-left or left-wing communist, they put the word left in quotations, because it's meant to be somewhat sarcastic. Um, and what he means by this is that we criticize socialist states. No, I mean, you of all people should know what this means. Like, you're the guy who used the Black Book of Communism, which is, a literally, which is literally a propaganda book of nothing but lies about uh, socialism. You're the guy who used that as your source. Then you claim that you didn't. Then I proved that you did. You made a video defending yourself, and when I proved that you actually were wrong, you took the video down. So you of all people should know. Any criticism that you levy at, you know, these states that, um, you know, criticizes their core, you know, the core of their economic system, the core of their political structure, um, any criticism of that nature is deemed uh, bourgeois propaganda. Are you kidding me? Seriously, are you kidding me? Well, I mean, this is... This is what I meant when I said that on some topics he seems to know what he's talking about and on some topics he's totally clueless. This only proves my point. When I said that anarchists they just mindlessly repeat bourgeois lies and they just believe them totally uncritically. I mean, he, he admits it. He says that, oh, there's no such thing as bourgeois propaganda or bourgeois lies, it's just criticism. No, you idiot. I mean, they're lies, they're lies, they're not true. That, it's not just criticism. Cold War propaganda calls Stalin a red czar, all this kind of nonsense, I mean, they they talk about the gulags like they're, you know, something, some kind of special thing, but they don't mention that every other country at the time had the exact same fucking thing. I mean, every other country only abolished penal servitude and hard labor in prisons in the 50s at the exact same time the Soviet Union did, and the anarchists are no better in this regard, they they also had hard labor 
um, and labor camps, even though anarchists probably don't know that, because they are generally pretty ignorant about their own history. They have a very romantic view of their own history. Um, not, not that there's anything wrong with labor camps in general. The problem with, uh, with gulags and the problem with all these labor camps and these places that use hard labor, you know, no matter which country had them, usually the problem was the bad and, uh, you know, hard conditions and not the idea of, uh, um, prisons that have labor. Anyway, if you think it's just fair criticism, then why did you take the video down where you uh, said that you didn't use um, the Black Book of Communism as your source? Like, do you think it's a valid source to use? I mean, it's lies. It's literally lies. So, I don't see how you can say that, um, you know, it's not bourgeois lies, it's just criticism, when it literally is lies. I mean, you can, you can criticize um quote unquote socialist states like the Soviet Union and China uh, and you can criticize them based on fact but you know people don't usually do that I said that anarchists buy into bourgeois lies and that's why they're anarchists they would be actual communists but because the right wing has taught them to fear communism because it's just scary and total totalitarian that's why they're anarchists that's why there's so many anarchists in these Western countries where people are not really exploited that badly and where bourgeois propaganda is more effective. In poorer countries, people don't trust the government. People know that the government is just lying. I mean, is it my fault that you guys often use the exact same criticisms that the right wing uses? That's not my fault, it's your fault. There are leftist critiques of the Soviet Union, there's plenty of them, but it's different from the, what, what the typical Trotskyist and typical anarchist criticism is. I'm sure that bourgeois propaganda itself has probably co-opted some of these Trotskyist and anarchist critiques into its own propaganda, because it's trying to appeal to leftist opponents of socialism as well. But I think it works the other way around too, and it probably more so. People who grow up in the West, they have no real reason to like the Soviet Union by default. In order to start to like the Soviet Union, you have to first study the history and then you have to figure out what is bullshit and what is not. It's much easier to just read the history books that the bourgeois has prepared for you uh, where it says that the Soviet Union was bad, it's much easier to, for people to accept that, which is, uh, which is why um, so many people do that. And, you know, the anarchists, they have their own particular view on this, so it's much easier for them to just believe all the lies, because it serves their own political agenda. For example, the Soviet Union. Um, you're just wrong. That's... It's a ridiculous argument. It's a common. I mean, all this video has done so far. You've you've just stated that I'm wrong on all these things. You haven't demonstrated that I'm wrong on anything. How is it my fault that you guys don't have enough source criticism? Like, you don't even seem to understand how serious this problem is. You trust the bourgeois propaganda so much that you literally think it's preposterous to even point that out. Okay, he also says that anarchists deny the class nature of the state. Um, anarchists do not deny the class nature of the state. Uh, very basic anarchist readings will define the state as a social institution that has its roots in class society, uh, that has its roots in the economic structure, that has its roots, roots in social relations. Um, Could that possibly be any more vague? When I said that anarchists deny class nature of the state, what I meant was that they see the state as such as being the root of all problems. You know, fascists believe in the state as such. Um, it's generally a right-wing conservative idea that the state is some kind of universal force which, like, goes beyond classes, that the, the, there is no specific class nature of the state, that the state is some kind of power above classes, that it's a universal power serving the interests of all classes. In typical anarchist fashion, they take this right-wing idea and they just turn it on its head. 
traditional right wingers they say that the state is something objective something that you know guards the interests of all classes anarchists on the other hand say that basically the total opposite of that they say that the state is something that is bad in itself um regardless of what class controls it the states the state is some kind of independent force but it, instead of being an independent positive force it's an independent negative force marxists on the other hand understand that yes like you said the state is the result of class society whether it be um society where the ruling class is the capitalist class or the, where the ruling class is the proletariat when there's no more class society when you know no more class conflicts then we don't need the state anymore this is actually kind of weird i mean you probably define class society in a different way than i do but if you believe that the state is a result of class society how what do you think it can be abolished when classes still remain i find that very odd but because the reason the dictatorship of the proletariat is needed is because there's still class conflicts but apparently the anarchists think that you know, even though there are class conflicts, we can just get rid of the state because the state has no direct relation with classes. I, I, I don't understand. <laughs> like, like, you're, you're just, just, uh, you're, you're just, just stating, stating things that aren't true. No, I'm not. When I was in a hangout with, um, you and some other people pretty recently, um, some other people um, said that the state is a monopoly on violence. I mean, I agree with that. That sounds like a pretty good, solid definition of what a state is. I would, the state is all the oppressive mechanisms like the police and the army and all that, secret police, intelligence service, whatnot, and then the, the bureaucracy which is needed to run things at this stage of development. That's how I would define a state. But when you say that, oh, the state is a result of class society and the state is... What what was your definition again? As a social institution that has its roots in class society. Well, all kinds of things have their roots in class society. What does... That, that's not enough. Uh, that has its roots in the economic structure. That That's not enough. That has its roots, roots in social relations. Well, that's not enough. Um... You know. All kinds of things have their roots in economic relations, class society, and um, social relations. Whatever. Like, the state... Why don't you just say that the state is a monopoly on violence? At least that makes sense. You're just stating things that aren't true, to, to, be, to be honest. Uh... The thing you don't want to admit is that you guys don't... I mean, the only reason why you're making these crazy accusations and making these points that are ir irrelevant is because you don't want to admit the fact that you guys think that the proletarian state and the capitalist state are the same thing. That's the root of this. That is what I accused you of and you don't want to address that specific point because it's true, it's undeniable. That is why you guys in your philosophical outlook are the same as right-wingers. The next point is anarchists want to abolish the state overnight. The argument comes from uh, Lenin's book, The State and Revolution. Well, usually when people say overnight, they don't mean that exactly, literally, of course. But the entire idea that the state can be abolished I don't care if it's overnight or if it's over a, over a weekend or over a month, it still can't be abolished. So instead of focusing on semantics, just explain to me why do you think the state can even be abolished? If you think it's the result of class society and economic relations, then how do you think you can abolish it because the class society is not abolished. Class society is only abolished in full communism, which we have never achieved yet, so therefore the state cannot be abolished. So what the anarchist program actually is, is the anarchist program sees um, the state as, again, the result of... Like, I'm sure this is going to be as clear and as precise as it possibly could, right? No, it's going to be super vague and it's not going to mean anything. Even social institutions, economic structures, 
and principally class society abolition of those um, things, those pre, you know, those um, economic structures, those social relations um, that lead to the state, uh, namely class society. Um, wow. Okay, so we actually kind of agree on something, except except the most important thing, of course, which is that, so you guys literally think that just because there's a revolution, there's no more class society anymore. There's no more, more class contradictions. None of these social relations are there anymore. Wow. Okay, so I suppose Franco didn't exist. I mean... You guys are like, yay, we don't need the state anymore because there's no more class contradictions. Then Franco comes there and kills you. I mean, I would say that that's a pretty major class contradiction. The fact that you even need to kill people would, like, would certainly suggest that there's some kind of contradiction going on. Why do you think the Soviet Union thought that they needed a state? Why do you think they thought they needed a military? Because there's capitalist countries. Why do you think they needed the NKVD? Well, because there's capitalist sympathizers inside the country who are trying to cause shit. Even Magno had his own secret police. I mean, anarchists had fucking concentration camps. They called them concentration camps. Now, I think that's a, an unfortunate choice of words in the historical context. Because what they actually were, they were prison camps and labor camps. They were not, you know, death camps. But, nevertheless, the anarchists certainly felt the need to lock up a big bunch of people and uh, keep an eye on them even though they were supposedly in stateless communism yay stateless communism where we lock people up in concentration camps and kill Catholics like clergymen no there was all kinds of class contradictions going on you can't just deny that that's preposterous so if state if the state ar arises from class contradictions which it certainly arises from, then the anarchists had a state. And I've, I've been saying this all along, the anarchists had a state, they just didn't call it a state. They're like, oh, this is the free association of workers, you know, while in reality it is a state, it's a fucking state. The anarchists had all the guns, I mean, sure, some individual people had guns as well, but they didn't really... Um, had any, have anything substantial enough to challenge the anarchist rule. So the anarchists control the state, they control the legislature, they control the economy, the military, all that shit. They got all these like prison camps and secret police and militia people on every street corner controlling everything. Maybe that's why you didn't want to call the state a monopoly on violence because clearly, clearly the anarchists had a monopoly on violence. I mean, in the hangout the other day, I was talking to another anarchist about this, and um, she said that um, that the anarchists in Spain they supposedly like fucked up on a lot of things. I don't think they fucked up on these things. I think they did it deliberately. I don't think it was a mistake. It was just something that had to be done because they recognized that class contradictions are all over the place, and they need to address those. But because they're anarchists, they couldn't admit that, so they instead were, like, trying to hide the fact. Uh, and they both see it as a kind of rigid uh, structure that exists above society, separate, uh, not separate from society, but... Okay, he's going there, he's going there. My fucking god, okay. No, we don't see it as something rigid above society at all. That's what anarchists believe. They think that the state is some force that has power on its own, that it's not because the bourgeois are controlling it, it's because the state in its in itself has some sort of significance. That That's your whole shtick. Above society, um, uh, and that um, contradicts any kind of uh, actual, um, you know, uh, quote-unquote self-governance or democracy or what have you. The state contradicts absolute freedom, absolute democracy, but like I've said before, I don't believe that democracy or freedom are binary things. You don't just have democracy or you don't have democracy. No, you 
it's a scale. You can have more democracy or less democracy. You can have more freedoms or less freedoms. It's not like an on and off switch, like, now we have freedom, now we don't. Um, but it's, of course, you cannot have total freedom when the state is still there. But again, unlike anarchists and unlike right-wingers, and, you know, I don't mean to deliberately lump you into the same category as right-wingers constantly, but it's just because that's the way it is. I'm sorry. Like, Marxists don't fetishize bourgeois conceptions of democracy or freedom. We don't have this insane fetish where we're like, oh, we must have democracy, whatever it fucking means at any given point. Like, we must have democracy. If we don't, then it's horrible. Like, if we don't have bourgeois parliamentarism, then it's horrible. If we don't have anarchist whatever, then it's horrible. No, democracy doesn't work like that. You can have more of it or less of it. Doesn't you know? You don't need to fetishize it like it's, like it's the only thing that matters. There's other things too that are important. Anarchists always talk about this. Like we must have like this ultimate freedom where there isn't any sta state telling people what to do. Like, but as I said, I care more about giving people food and shelter and all that kind of stuff. I don't give a f like, you know. Um, he uh, re references a conversation he had about me. With the pur about the purges, um, okay, and he um, says that I gave him a Wikipedia source that predominantly. Well, we have already been through this, but okay, let's refresh our memories, shall we? He quote, quote unquote, predominantly only cites the Black Book of Communism, um, and he reaches this conclusion, and you can see, I mean, you know, you can see. The evidence that he has for this, he displays it. He reaches this conclusion because he looks down into the Stalin era, the, the place where... Where you told me to look. Um, I told him to go on the article specifically for the... Exactly. ...purges. And he clicks one annotation, at least the Black Book of Communism. Yes. Uh, that doesn't mean that it only predominantly no that's not actually what happened there's the one thing that directly leads there but then the other sources that there were because i think there were three sources the other source used the like i mean there was one thing sourced directly from the black book of communism then there was were two other sources and the other source the other book used the Black Book of Communism as its own source, so that also leads to the Black Book of Communism, and the third book used the previous book, which used the Black Book of Communism, so in one way or another, they all lead to the Black Book of Communism. Uh, scroll down to the end of the Wikipedia article, and there's a lot of sources, more than... But they're not all about the Stalin era, like, we were talking about the Stalin section. The three sources in the Stalin section at least at the time when we had this discussion, I don't know, it might have changed now, but I don't know, maybe it hasn't. Um, but when we had that discussion, they all led to this, to the Black Book of Communism, all three of them. I even said that in my video, like, if you don't believe me, then go well, go watch my video. It's still, still there, I didn't take it down, even though you took yours down. Oh yeah, he thinks uh, anarchists are anti-communists. Um, okay. If if you use anti-communist sources, if you repeat anti-communist propaganda, anti-communist lies, then by that in that sense, yes, you're not anti-communist in the sense that you claim to be an anarcho-communist. So there you go. But you're you're the you're anti-communist in the traditional sense of the word. Anti-communist in the Cold War sense of the word. Anti-communist is someone who spouts all this nonsense about the Soviet Union. But why does anarcho-communism exist, and why is it the predominant... Either you're stupid or you are... I don't know. He makes a point that uh, Stalin makes in his critique of anarchism, that uh, Marxism starts with the masses. Um, so it, you know, it seeks to benefit the masses uh, first, and anarchism seeks to benefit the individual first. This is wrong. Uh, this is wrong. That's all you need. 
just say this is wrong. Okay. Um, I read that uh, piece by Stalin. It's a bad piece. Well, okay. Do you have any care to like provide any evidence? It's it's polemical, is what it is. But do go on. That um, that's not true. Um, both anarchism and Marxism um, see the emancipation of the masses. I mean, Marxists don't start by saying the kind of shit that anarchists start with. Anarchists start by saying that, you know, only if the individual is free can the collective be free, or I don't remember exactly what the thing is, but that's like, when I went to read up on Proudhon on that anarchist website, that's what they had as their website motto. It was like the first thing I saw, there was the quote like, only if the individual is free, then can everyone else be free. Like, I mean, again, I'm mostly concerned with the fact that people don't have enough food to eat, they don't have enough water to drink, they don't have a, you know, a place to stay, place to live. You know, we fix that kind of shit first. Then we start thinking about how we're going to organize society more democratically. And I don't have any, um, you know, utopian illusions that we're going to just arrive at some kind of totally harmonious situation immediately or very rapidly. And then we're going to just dis and then we're going to just abolish all authority and live in paradise. This entire focus on that anarchists have in this idea that we shouldn't have any hierarchy, that we shouldn't have any authority, you know, perfectly demonstrates my point. That shit doesn't matter. It doesn't. You guys only care about it because you're a, a bunch of petty bourgeois individualists. Like, I said it, now you can get mad at me again, but that's, that's the only reason you people care about that. I mean, when you're starving to death, it doesn't matter if there's authority or not. ...of the individual as mutually inclusive. Um... Both, um, so liberating the masses of society will inherently mean liberating individuals. There we go, there we go. I mean, he's, re he's rephrasing it slightly so that it doesn't sound as stupid as it is, but there we fucking go. Only if the individual is free, like, fuck the individual. I don't give a fuck about the individual, okay? Hitler was an individual. Fuck that individual, okay? giving them individual autonomy. Individual authority needs the of... Ah! Fuck! Marx um, doesn't like Bakunin's conception of freedom. He thinks it's idealistic. Um, so he posits a definition of freedom where individuals control their material conditions of existence. Um, and... Yeah, exactly. But don't you understand? Don't you understand? This kind of full freedom where individuals have total autonomy and all that shit, it only comes in full communism. It's not practical to focus on that shit right the fuck now like it's the most important thing. Because it's not. It's, it's something rather vague and rather theoretical and abstract, which is gonna come later. Okay? Yeah, so this is wrong. Um, he also uses this... Um this quote to kind of paint anarchism as individualistic. Anarchism is not inherently individualistic. Uh, oh, it's not. Okay, well, I will grant you that some forms of anarchism are more individualistic than others. I mean, there's actually something called individualistic anar anarchism indi or individualist anarchism. And it's... And I'm not talking about, like, anarcho-capitalism or any of that horseshit. I mean, anarcho-capitalists are not anarchists, okay? But, like, okay, you say it's not inherently individualistic, okay, but I don't agree with that. Um, in fact, most anarchist tendencies and the general trend of anarchism is rejects individualism. Um, uh, there are certain tendencies that call themselves, call themselves individualist anarchists, but they're usually at the periphery of the anarchist. Yeah, okay. Just because there's a small group who are like openly like yes we are super individualistic that doesn't mean that the rest of you are perfectly not individualistic you're just less individualistic this entire video you haven't demonstrated anything you're in all of your so-called like evidence or proof all of that is just 
you're saying that it's this is wrong. Most anarchists are actually not individualistic. Like, you need to demonstrate that somehow. You can't just say it like it's a an obvious fact. He says that because anarchists reject vanguardism, we want to quote unquote lag behind the spontaneous spontaneity of the masses. Um, Anarchists typically make the same kind of argument that Rosa Luxemburg makes against vanguardism. Um, her argument against vanguardism is that vanguardism, rather than consisting of an organized uh, socialist movement of the workers, is consists of structures that dominate the workers, that subordinate the workers to um, to uh, uh, an above power, um, to to what are called uh, "quote unquote" professional revolutionaries. Um, well, I mean that's called militancy. Yeah, professional revolutionaries, professionalism, because this this shit is not easy. Okay, suppresses an actual organized socialist workers' movement. How is it not? What like? The fact that we want to take people into this tightly knit organization and then be as professional about it as possible and then we are actually gonna get funds and we're gonna give funds to these people so that they can focus only on revolution like that's their own only thing is revolution that's not organized but like this loose collection this mob that's more organized like what whatever you said about lagging behind the spontaneity of the whatever. Well, I mean, obviously it's polemical. You guys don't say, oh, we want to lag behind the, the spontaneity of the mass, but that's what you do. Like, we need to get the, the people who are most experienced and most theoretically advanced. Those people need to be at the front, okay? They're the, they're the vanguard. They're the tip of the spear. They're the leading group. And then everyone else marches behind them. Because the vanguard is pointing people to the correct direction. They're like, okay, this is the correct tactics for this. This is the correct theory to understand this. And they try to convince everyone else. And then everyone else is either convinced or is not. And they will follow the vanguard if the vanguard is doing their thing correctly. How is it subordinating anything to anything? in? Because it's totally voluntary. Like, you don't have to follow, follow the vanguard. You don't have to join the party. Like, what is the problem here? Like, do you understand that you're not forced to join the, the party, okay? Or is it the typical Menshevik um, argument that you're making? That, like, the party shouldn't be so, you know tightly knit and shouldn't be so exclusive like you should just allow any asshole to come in who wants to join because obviously that's gonna work just perfectly right no like do you understand that revolution is not a joke it's not a game it's different when you're just going in a to a protest like okay whatever anybody can come they can say what the fuck ever but if you're trying to actually overthrow the state then you need to have some security, you need to be able to trust people, you need to have some kind of organizational discipline so that somebody doesn't just do anything stupid like the anarchists do. You know, the classic thing that, that happens in, um, or that, that used to happen in uh, in Finland in when there were big strikes, the police would try to provoke the strikers to use violence so that the police could, could then beat the living shit out of them and shut the thing down. Um, so it was extremely important to have good discipline. The police would try to infiltrate the strikers so that they would have like uh, somebody, like uh, an agent provocateur who would attack the police so the police could attack the strikers. They needed to, so the strikers needed to have extremely good discipline to, so that nobody gets provoked and uses violence, and so that they can stop these, uh, stop these police uh, provocations. And that was done together with the party. There were communists in the trade union um, branches, actually leading the branches of the trade unions. 
I could just imagine how that would have gone with the anarchists. Covered individualism. He also says that anarchists only want kind of really decentralized small communities. I mean, I've seen uh, people call themselves anarchists advocate that, but that's not the... There's a difference between being a Proudhon supporter who openly advocates for like these de decentralized, isolate, isolated communities. That's one thing, but there's another thing. The anarchists who say that, oh, we actually want nationwide planning and we want this and that. That's what they say in in their propaganda, but that doesn't translate to their politics. Like, how can you have uh, total autonomy and nationwide planning? How does that work? That's like having democracy, but... but uh, no subordination of the minority to the majority. It doesn't work like that. In democracy, first you debate, then you have a vote, and then when uh, you know the votes are counted, then the decision should be binding on everyone. Otherwise, what is the point? You know, you, de you do realize that there is a contradiction between common plan and then the interests of the localities. There is a contradiction between a unified plan and local control okay and and this contradiction exists in marxism as well of course so it has to be a compromise between the the autonomy of the localities and then the unified plan um obviously the reason anarchists have a problem with this is because not because that they don't like organization like because they're individualists they don't like, I mean, you know, they're anarchists. Of course they have a problem with that. He wants to, like, the Finnish Bolshevik uh, things. Um, but it's rather because um, anarchists favor... Um, Lack of organization. <laughs> ...organized bodies of people that are... We don't have a problem with organization. We just favor things that are organized in a looser, less, you know, less rigid, blah, 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 blah. And then it translates. Eventually, when you get through all the bullshit, it translates to lack of organization, a lack of discipline, a lack of unity. Or decentralized rather than centralized. Yes, exactly. So the process is, you know, the, so organization flows horizontally and is organized horizontally rather than organized from the top down. He says that he opposes this idea, this Proudhon, I, Proudhonist idea that, uh, you know, let's just have small, decentralized, isolated communities that trade with each other, voluntarily, mutual, whatever. He says that he's opposed to that. Then he says that he's in favor of, like, um, planning. But then he gives all these caveats, like, okay, we have planning, but it's decentralized planning, and it's horizontal planning, and it's... I don't think that's planning, okay? Also, when it comes to the topic of centralism, the reason anybody uses centralism is not because they're evil, because they just want to control people and whatnot. No, the reason everyone, literally everyone, uses centralism is because it's efficient. It works better, okay? So, when you need to get shit done as fast as possible, as efficiently as possible, then a certain amount of centralism is probably required, okay? So, for example, in let's take a military example. You need to have a central command of the military. Makes perfect sense. Instead of doing what the anarchists did, which is like in um, in Catalonia, they would have they would be divided into columns. Each column would they would elect their own officers. Then um, when there would be an assault, they would like vote if you want to join the assault or, or not which already sounds disastrous. Like, fuck no, we don't want to join any assault. Like, okay, then the entire army is just going to disintegrate. I mean, the army is a good example because the army clearly is not a democracy. The army is based on hierarchy. It's based on the fact that the people above tell the people below what to do. And that has proven very efficient in war, okay? The same goes for most workplaces. People at the top tell the people at the bottom what to do. And that's also proven to be very efficient. Now, of course, there's all kinds of problems with that, but only an idiot would think that we could just do away with centralism immediately 
these kinds of horizontal ways of organizing, they don't exactly work as well. So, yeah, we can use them when the situation allows for that, but we shouldn't have that as a priority. That shouldn't be the main focus. And the entire anarchist shtick is that they need, they try to make people believe that society where everything is organized non-hierarchically and horizontally is just gonna work as well, not not as well, but better, better than a society that has centralism. And historically they've always had a very hard time making people believe that for obvious reasons. Like in the anarchist army or militia, they... Can you imagine what kind of military discipline they would have? Like, people would be drunk, people would, would be deserting left and right, people would leave their post, people would even leave their post because they were bored. Well, it's the common administration of things, which is what socialism is, incidentally enough. Um, well, just yesterday you told me that you don't think that socialism should be defined as worker control, It, you know. I think socialism should be defined as worker own or common ownership of the means of production. Common ownership is the best way to define it. So now you're saying that common administration of things is socialism. Okay, what the fuck is common administration of things? Nobody knows. We briefly talked about this in the hangout. Like, if the workers elect ministers and the ministers decide, is that common administration? The workers have some participation in that. Well, you said it's not. Well, I don't necessarily think that it is either. But it's not very clear what this what this vague term like common administration or worker control what it is. It's not very clear at all. Like anarchists seem to have a they have very specifically unspecific ideas. They say we want full freedom. We want no hierarchy. We want worker control of everything. We want per, like common administration of everything. When you ask them what does that mean in concrete terms they have no clue but that's what they want they won't accept anything less but no nah, socialism is like where uh, Stalin takes control of industry and uh... what the fuck man <laughs> the thing about small communities he mentions that you know the town and the countryside have to be connected um, you know, in order to make sure that things uh, organ are organized smoothly in the society, and uh, Kropotkin actually writes about that and why that's Kropotkin writes about all kinds of stuff, but Kropotkin is a utopian idiot. I mean, well, he's not an idiot, but he's a utopian. He's not an idiot. He just held idiotic views on things. Okay, so there's a, there's a difference. Kropotkin's theory of how things should be done is basically this. We will have anarchism, and then mana will just rain from the sky, and it'll, it's going to be beautiful and uh, harmonious, and it's going to be a paradise. That's his answer to everything. It's important in the conquest. I mean, yes, that is an exaggeration, but read anything he has ever written, and it's always like super... We will... It's always... It's the, it's the definition of utopia. It's like everything will run very smoothly, despite me providing no evidence that that's going to be the case. That's utopian. And the other aspect of utopianism is this, that you're going to just create these extremely meticulous plans of how shit is going to be organized. And considering he wrote this like a hundred years ago, it's, it's now totally useless because he's like talking about how we're going to have these workers like astronomy societies and how we're going to do this with steam power and shit, like, all that is totally antiquated bullshit that doesn't have any bearing on reality. It didn't have then, but it has even less today. Uh, I thought that was funny. Um... I mean, the only reason you think it's funny because you are you are un so uncritical of this bullshit. It's so obvious bullshit and you're so uncritical about it, like, like, Kropotkin makes it seem so plausible. Well, not really. No, no, no. Uh, he also says that many anarchists believe in trade. Actually, uh, the predominant form 
Well, I didn't take a poll, okay? So some of them do, some of them don't. I've seen plenty of them who do. I mean, Proudhon believed in trade, Bakunin pr believed in trade. You seem to like both of them. I mean, Kropotkin didn't, so that's two out of three. But anarchism is anarchist communism, which rejects um, markets. Uh, so that's wrong, too. Well, I don't know which one is stupider, to be honest. I mean, like believing in believing in trade as a as a final permanent solution is a horrible idea, of course. But also, this idea that just, we're gonna just do away with trade immediately is also extremely stupid. Which is, and it, you know, it leads to all kinds of stupid shit. Like we're gonna force everyone to barter. We're gonna. Um, we're gonna get we're gonna abolish money but we're gonna replace it with like labor vouchers all kinds of artificial shit like like that like oh it's not money it's labor vouchers which is fucking money he also says that the anarchist quote unquote critique of communism is essentially you know utilizing bourgeois lies against uh, socialist state haven't we already been through this? Uh, number one, anarchists, many anarchists... The anarchists are actually communists, whatever, get to the point. Anarchists are communists, as uh, I uh, have been saying throughout this entire thing. The pain! Um, so, um, it's stupid to... Um, uh, what? The anarchist criticism of Marxism is predominantly that it has a stagist conception of history that it okay it ignores um, it focuses on the working class um, what the fuck kind of criticism is that what to a point of detriment where for example what the fuck man what for example as Bakunin points out in statism and anarchy um, where Marxists in Bakunin's time, Marxists of the First International, often focused on the industrial proletariat of the cities and ignored the exploited peasantry in Russian countryside. Are you mental? What the hell? What? I mean, I was so confused there for a moment. I was like, holy shit, he just said that Marxism is too proletarian. Then I was like, is he going to say that we need to focus more on the petty bourgeoisie? And he fucking did. He fucking did. I can't believe this. Put that, make that into a t-shirt, like... Marxism is... Marxism focuses on the proletariat to the point of detriment. <laughs> End of quote. Red and black revolutionary. Oh god. Oh god. To the point of detriment. I mean... How can you have it both ways? Like, how can how can people accuse Bolshevism of being agrarian socialism or fo or trying to do socialism in an agrarian country? Like, that's a bad thing. But also accuse them of not uh, taking the peasantry into account. How can you have it both ways? I've never understood this. This is like when people call Stalin a Jew and an anti-Semite. I don't understand. Like, are you are you really this stupid? Or are you? Just, yes, that is the anarchist critique. But I, I'm not talking about that critique. I'm talking about all this shit like, oh, Stalin was a monster. Stalin controlled everything. There was no freedom. Was, ah. That shit is what every anarchist uses to justify his position, okay? That's why, why don't, why don't you like actual communism? You're like, because Stalin is... Ah. And that's what this entire thing is based on. That's probably why you are an anarchist. Like, believe it or not, most people are not actually so individualistic that they would, just by default, be like, okay, I care only about principles of freedom. Like, the only people who care about that, by default, are libertarians. The way you make leftists um, act like that, in other words, the way you make leftists into anarchists, is by telling them that anything else is evil Stalinism. You know what? I, I had an idea. I will make a video where I will take anarchist comments and I will take right-winger comments and 
I won't tell you which one is which and I will have you guess because you won't be able to tell. It's the same exact arguments. I mean, I'll, I'll throw some Trotskyists there too. It's going to be hilarious. Um, anarchists have no problem with violence uh, as a con. Yeah, they, that's what you say, but then again... Concept, um, unless they're anarcho-pacifists, which that tendency is heavily criticized by anarchists. Well, yeah, true, true enough. Um, I wasn't even thinking about that. Anarchists uh, have a problem with the way violence is used in certain ways. Uh, anarchists... We don't have pr a problem with violence in theory, we just have a problem with violence in actuality. So therefore, you cannot criticize us for being against violence. This is the entire problem with anarchists. In theory, they ag agree with all kinds of things, but their actual practice doesn't reflect that. What I said in my video was that anarchists always whine about the fact that the Bolsheviks used violence against anarchists. And that they, in general, that they were supposedly cruel, bloodthirsty, and authoritarian. Again, which is a, something that is mainly propagated by the bourgeois propaganda machine, which anarchists just, they just eat it up. They're like, yes, the Bolsheviks were so bloodthirsty, they just hated anarchists for no reason. <laughs> so far, you haven't said anything that would, in the slightest, disprove that fact. Um, so that covers violence. He says that anarchism doesn't work. Okay. Which I think, I think is it's hilarious. hilarious. Um, uh, which it's the same. I mean, he's just uh, using the same kind of argument that is said generally about communism and applying. I mean, you have to be able to see the validity of this, though. I mean, if the anarchists are able to set up a thing that lasts for a couple of years with like massive backing from the Soviets and the Spanish and all that. You know, I think it's still, you could still argue that anarchism doesn't work. Like, yeah, okay, they were able to keep that shit up for a couple of years, but it, at the end of the day, it just doesn't work. But you can't say the same for the Soviet Union. Like, oh, they were just able to keep it up artificially for 70 years. No, you can't keep things up artificially for that long. So, to be perfectly honest, I don't know if anarchism works. I think it probably doesn't, but I, I don't know, because we have never seen it work long term. So... Who knows? There's no real reason to think it does work, but... He thinks that anarchism will restore capitalism because it advocates uh, small communities. It's not just the small community trading thing that leads to restoration of capitalism. It's the entire thing. Like, you say that you have nationwide economic planning, but then you clarify that by explaining that it's not really actually nationwide economic planning. It's just called economic planning, it's actually something else. All that stuff, that all leads to leads back to capitalism. Anarchism, anarchism is, is not, not materialist. materialist. Um, you well, okay, I, I want to hear this. Because anarchism is not materialist. Um, haven't, been, like, haven't we already kind of been over this? Like, Proudhon was an idealist, so that's one thing. But then Kropotkin, of course, claims to be a, a materialist, but he just isn't. He he is a total utopian. It's not a very it's not very good materialism. Like it's kind of weird how Proudhon was the idealist, but he wanted to use dialectics. He couldn't. He tried to. The only thing he actually did was use dialectical like terminology. He didn't actually use dialectics. But it's kind of weird because when when anarchists moved to trying to be materialist, then they dropped, um, ma then they got rid of dialectics. Pack actually, he talked about Anarcho Pack in the video. Anarcho Pack has a really good video in which he talks, um, about, you know, on his channel, in which he talks about, um, uh, the ways in which anarchists have historic, classical anarchists have historically used materialist conceptions of history. I have a very strong feeling of deja vu right now. I'm pretty sure that I, that I even talked about this in the very video that you're responding to. Just because Kropotkin believed that there's only matter, and just because he used natural sciences, you know, 
okay, technically he he is a materialist in his philosophical outlook, but his ideology is not based on proper materialism, it's bad materialism. Like some, some anarchists are outright not materialists, but some of them are just bad materialists. I'm, I mean, I can understand why you would object to me saying that that's not really materialistic, you know. I can, I can, I can see why you would object to that, but just, you, you're not gonna ref refute that point by just saying that, no, we actually, by definition, believe in materialism. That's not where we're, that's not what we're arguing about. It's the same thing with the planning and communism, like, I know you call yourself a communist, I know you say you believe in planning, but then when we get to the actual nitty-gritty, like, what does that planning mean? What does that materialism mean? What does this, like, what does this communism mean? Then, then it gets more complicated. Then all of a sudden it's not so clear. Maybe I should have just explained things more clearly, because you're just misunderstanding everything I said. Like, do you really think I'm so stupid that I'm actually going to say that you guys literally are all idealists. Like, think about it this way, okay? Like, do you know what positivism is? Positivism is this idea that things that can be em empirically proven with our own experience, like things that you can see with your own eyes, for example, that those are actually real. You know, positivism claims to be a school of materialism. So they're like, okay, well, I, like, I can take this pen, and I can touch it, I can look at it, I can, you know, whatever, I can write words with it, therefore, this thing actually exists. Well, Lenin pointed out that, what does that actually mean? It means that the only thing that matters is your own perception. In other words, it's all basically just in your head. So, basically, this is like inside-out absolute idealism you know like there's there's dualism which is that there's matter and there's ideas matter and spirit but then there's materialism which is that there's only matter and then there's absolute idealism which is says that there's nothing but spirit so in a way positivism actually actually is absolute idealism in the same way even though anarchism claims to be based on materialism it's not really based on materialism you just get so hung up on words, you have no idea what I'm talking about, do you? Like, I, again, I don't know if that's my fault or your fault, but... Uh, you also said that anarchists are utopian socialists. Um, Proudhon uh, and uh, the Proudhonists um, were utopian socialists, yes, uh, but... They were utopian socialists by, you know, they call themselves that. I'm saying that other anarchists are utopian socialists in actuality not just that's not that's not what they look like that's what they are Proudhon sounds like looks like and is by definition and is by his own admission and by his actions a utopian Kropotkin and other anarchists and anarcho-communists they they don't claim to be utopian socialists they would never admit to being utopian socialists but they are in their actual practice and actual ideology, utopian. Uh, this is like the entire, like this is a huge problem in this entire debate or conversation that we're having. You focus entirely on what things call, what people call themselves, what they claim or profess to be, what they're called, stuff like that. I, on the other hand, focus on what things actually are. I don't care what they call themselves. Uh, I mean, this is ex exactly the same point you made about petty bourgeois socialism. It's like, just because you guys are not actually middle class necessarily, doesn't mean that your ideology is not based, based in petty bourgeois ideology. Yeah, I posted a comment on your video. I mean, I know you already saw it, but I'm just telling my viewers. I posted a comment on his video saying that this was a pretty decent response. Decent in that it wasn't outrageously insulting like because recently I've just been dealing with those right-wing trolls who are just horrendous um, I think red and black revolutionary is actually a normal human being with a you know functioning brain 
so that's nice, you know, for a change. But, uh, but uh, yeah, I said in my comment that it's a decent video response, but I didn't really agree with anything that was said in it. So that's the end of this response. I will edit this video down. I don't know, I don't know how long this is going to be. Probably pretty long because his video is already almost 40 minutes. So if you want to watch his video, I'll put that in the, put the link in the description. I know that Red and Black already said that he doesn't necessarily respond to this. You know, whatever. People have other things to do. I'm not going to demand a response. It's like I hate it when those right-wing trolls make a video to me and then they demand, they demand my time. It's the same with uh, that anti-dialectics person who always, like, pesters me, sends me literally like 20 messages telling me to respond. Like, uh, like I have nothing better to do except to respond to their stupid ass videos and stupid ass things. I would, uh, I would like a response, but I'm not expecting him to respond necessarily. So yeah, that's the end of this. Uh, if, if you guys have any questions or comments or whatever, then feel free to post, the, post them as usual and all that stuff. So I will see you guys next time. Red salute.